Direct from Montreal, Canada, this is Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Welcome to this episode of Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone, it is a legendary guitarist, Frank Marino. His new live at the Agora Theatre DVD Blu-ray is available now. Just head over to mahoganyrussia.com. You know, when you have Frank Marino on, you don't need a long introduction because the conversation is so rich and so extensive that you just got to jump right into it. So that is what I'm going to do. And so without further ado, here is one, the only, legendary Canadian guitarist, Frank Marino. We are speaking with uh, guitarist Frank Marino, the new DVD Blu-ray is live at the Agora Theatre. Many, many years in the making, but uh, as we say in Montreal, uh, bonjour, Frank. How are you? Comment How are you doing? doing, Mitch? Good. Always a pleasure to talk to you. It's, uh, you know, every time that a, a band comes in, whether it's Frank Hannon with Tesla, whether it's Uli John Roth, whether it's Zach Wilde, they're like, oh, this is the city Frank's in. We got to go see Frank. I got to go meet Frank. Can we meet Frank? Is Frank around? Can Frank come to the show? Can... <laughs> it, it's amazing. They all, they all love you. They all respect you. I love them too. Yeah, and they all want to meet you. They all, well, meet you. I mean, obviously they've met you before, but they all want, they all want you there. Um, that, that's got to be comforting to know that when bands roll in, there's still this great admiration for what you've done and what you are and what you do. Well, I respect them as musicians, so it's like, you know, we have our friends here in Montreal we like to get together with, and have my friends in other cities we like to get together with, but guys like Frank Hannon, for instance, I mean, he spent a couple of days with me when he was here. These are these are just really good people, you know, like they're just great people, and you just love to be around musicians who are great people, and believe it or not, most of the things we talk about when we're hanging out is not music. <laughs> we're talking about other things, and you know, all the other things that we like, but they're great people. They've supported me. I've support them. And, uh, and, and they support a lot of other guys too, as, as I do. So yeah, that's, it's a camaraderie of being in, you know, of being in something, you know, with, yeah. with anybody. That's, that's the good part of it. You know, it's the great part. And, and unless I'm mistaken, I think Frank was telling me that you were talking about horses and dogs and other, other various oh, animals. And yeah. Stuff. Like his wife does some really good cutting with horse, horse cutting and stuff like that. And she, you know, she, she's won a tournament and stuff, and, you know, won a few things like that and just really cool stuff that, you know, we live our lives in that bubble of music and, um, a lot of it's a lot of the time in our life is spent in front of people, uh, and then when we get together like that, you you got to figure we're not really we're not really talking about that too much. We're 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 talking about the other stuff we do, <laughs> which is really cool stuff, you know. Whether it's hockey or cars or horses or whatever, you know. It's funny you mentioned car. I mean, hockey. So, somebody just said to me, "Hey, so and so is coming at the end of April," and I went, "Well, that's." playoff hockey time so i'll get back i'll get <laughs> yeah. back to you on whether i'll be going or not depends on how the habs are doing but i but i will yeah. connect the uh, the frank thing uh to the dvd because he i was talking to him recently mm -hmm. and he was going on about how he got to see this dvd and how exciting it was for him and he really had this sort of kid in a candy store kind of experience with you. So, so let's talk about this DVD. It took, it took many years to get done, but it's done. We, yeah. we, we know the story. You went in, you had to redo yeah. all the drums. Okay. We, we had to fix stuff. Yeah. That's yeah, that, what I say. I had to fix some stuff, some stuff, right? The, the, the story has been told. In fact, we did an interview where we sort of detailed the entire thing, but now that it's yeah. out, um, talk to me about, about first of all, that, that feeling and that emotion of like, Oh, okay. It's done. And now where do we go from here? It took a while. I mean, it took a while to unwind from it. I thought it might take a day or two or a week, but no, it's, I'm still unwinding from it, and it's December. So I'm still kind of getting, getting over the fact that my mind was in it for so long. And seeing that it's doing so well, and it really is, um, I, I'm... <laughs> just so gratified you know like i really didn't i had i had stopped thinking about how it would do like years and years ago i was like it had nothing to do with how it would do it was just a, i just wanted to get it done i wanted to make sure that it was correct 
and uh, and here it is. And oh, well, you know, there's a lot of people that really seem to seem to think it's really good. So I I can't tell anymore. I think it's really good, but I you know, whenever you work on something, you think it's good. Otherwise, you wouldn't work on it. But from what the feedback I'm getting, it's seems to be really being accepted very well and particularly by peers so i like that that's yeah. good and it's a as it says in the in the little press release it's it's a epic 6 hour live performance so so talk to me about your concept of live performance because i've seen you before mm-hmm. and there doesn't seem to be well, correct me let me say it this way and then you can sort of fi- fix my bumps and bruises here but there doesn't seem to be a roadmap. You don't have the same 15 song set list. You know, you're not like some of our classic rock guys that do the oh, same God, thing. No. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, talk to me about yeah. about about how you sort of plan and prepare for for the live thing because it's not like okay, we're going to play this song, this song, this song and we'll be done at 9:30. No. When you show no, up at no, a Frank no. show, it's like okay, what am I going to get tonight? You know, so how how do you sort of make the magic if I if I can put it that way? You, you, well, you're going to play, right? So the first thing you do is start playing. Now you might say, guys, tonight we're going to start with blah, you know, the answer or, you know, Dragonfly or whatever. You'll pick a tune. Like that's going to be the start point, you know? From there, <clears throat> it's really a question of the music and the crowd and, you know, what you're doing, the environment could be the color of the sky, whatever. It's, it's giving you hints as to where you want to go next. So you know that the songs really are <clears throat> even in and of themselves. They have a beginning and then they usually have a jam somewhere in them. And that jam can go into a lot of places. And sometimes the jam takes you into another song or it makes you think, hey, let's do this one next. And by the way, it's not always me that's sort of hinting at this. It could be something the drums do or, or that, that Mick does or, or, or the bass, you know, like it's, it's a really sort of a free-form thing that has a little bit of boundaries. Look at it this way. <clears throat> you can live and have a nice backyard, or you can live and have a nice backyard where the fences are a couple of miles away. And some days you'll play in a certain area, and some days you'll play in another, you know, depending. And it's really an improvisational thing. And I think I do that because it's, well, I've always done that, and I think that's why I do that, because I never, never really knew it any other way. And I think bands who are listening to this will know that that's kind of what happens when you get together with your friends just to sort of make music, not to like practice tunes or anything, but to make music. That's kind of what happens at every different rehearsal, if you want to call them rehearsals. And I just keep it that way, but except that the crowd's there, and you can tell what they like, and you could tell what they don't. And one, you know, one night I might want to play a lot of really slow blues tunes, but I can see that it's just not the night to do it. So I'll start veering off into another area. And some nights I want to play some really wild rock stuff or metal type of thing, but I can see that it's not not the night to do it. So I'll I'll move over a little bit into another style. That's really it. It's improvisational. It's very much like jazz, like what jazz guys do. Okay, so, so how important then is the crowd to, to what you're doing? Because, you know, you think of the different regions and you go see a, a show in Quebec or in Boston or in Detroit and, you know, they're in your face and they're pumping their fists and they're excited. And then you go to a place like Japan where they'll sort of sit politely and wait. You know, how important then is, is the audience on dictating where the songs are going to go and how long you're going to play? I mean, if they sort of scream and stomp, they get a longer show? Like, how do you sort of, what's the interaction? Or is it, I'm on stage and there's a disconnect? No, there, there, no, there's no disconnect. Certainly there's no disconnect. You're, you're picking up on it. It's very much like having a dance partner, you know, like you're, you're sort of, you're going with the flow of it. The audience, I like an audience to be imaginatively involved. So what I mean by that is, like when you read a novel, you get imaginatively involved. You get to use your imagination while you're reading the novel. The novel's all laid out, but you imagine a lot of it. And it's the same as opposed to a movie where you you basically observe a movie. <laughs> you know, you don't get to imagine anything. They're both laid out, but one invites the imagination. And I think that if you can, if you can 
feel what the audience might be able to imagine from what you're playing, you really do pay attention to that, but not in the sense where you're thinking about the audience. It's sort of almost like the audience for me is like uh, something that's always been there, probably because I started so young. You know, my, my introduction into music at 14 and 15 years old was in front of people. And I was always in front of people. So it's very normal and natural for me to be playing while people are there. When I did all my records in the studio, all the records, there was always dozens of people in the studio. It was never those closed sessions. It was like a party. And I think that the audience is very much the same thing. I really respect an audience. And one of the things that bothers me about many of the guys in my industry, not all of them, but some, is that they'll tend to come off a stage where maybe the gig didn't go so well or the sound wasn't good or they didn't get the clapping that they thought they should have. And they'll start talking about the audience as if, oh, this is a terrible audience, as if an audience is some kind of monolithic person. And really, I don't agree with that, you know. Um, an audience. And I, I've heard that, by the way. I've oh, heard we've it. all heard that. Oh, yeah. you just oh the crowd sucked tonight. Well, the yeah, crowd was great tonight. At, you know. at any gigs that you were at, especially the festivals, and you're going to hear a, a a lot of guys talking about the crowd was terrible, or the crowd did this, or the crowd was that, as if the crowd was one person. It's just not true. It may seem like a monolith, but it's just not true. And if an act goes out and maybe they didn't go over very well, and maybe it was because the sound was bad or the sound man didn't do his job. Who knows the reason? But uh, I don't. I think it's highly insulting to sort of put it on the crowd. You know, the crowd. It's not. It's not normal. I, I don't look at it that way. Hey, you ever go in an, in an arena? If ever you're in an arena when, um, and you'll understand this because you're from Montreal, so you've been to a hockey game. Um, so when you go into an arena at a rock show and I spend a lot of time going into the, into the crowd between bands, I don't always, hide, you know, hide my dressing room. And when you stand in a crowd and a band finishes a tune and there's a cheer, it always seems like the people in your immediate area, like a, you know, 30 feet aren't really screaming and cheering as much as the overall sound that you hear from the room. It's almost like your immediate area of that place is a little bit more somber. And it's funny because you go to any area of the arena and you always get that same effect. And yet when you hear the sound of the whole arena, it sounds like everyone's going crazy. Well, when you've been in a crowd such as a hockey game, when they score an overtime goal for the Stanley Cup final, that's when you hear the whole crowd. <laughs> in your immediate area. It's usually a lot stronger. So I think that people in the audience are into what you're doing, but they're also, they're there to support you. You're not really, you're not really, you're not really being fair if you didn't do very well and maybe you say it's their fault. I just don't find that, I find that a little bit, um, what's the word when you sort of look down on people? I don't know the word for it, but I find it wrong. Condescending? Yeah, it's a bit condescending. And um, I just don't, I don't agree with that. I, I, I try to play every song in a show as if it's kind of the only song <laughs> in it, the show. It's the encore. And, and, and by the way, in terms of crowd noise, sometimes it, you're, you're, you're standing in that quiet place because the crowd noise you hear and this is what drives me crazy with some of the big arena shows, is they're pumping in crowd swell to make it sound bigger than it is. And it's just like, really? We're going to even fake the crowd now? Come on. Oh, I didn't know they were doing that. That's something new. Oh, they've been doing that for for the last few years where... Oh, my goodness. Where no, they, now you're really freaking me out they, here. They pump in crowd <laughs> swell, so... So you've what? got you've got the backing tapes and you've got the triggers and you've got all you've, you've got all this stuff going on to cheat. And now there are some bands in the large oh arena gosh. that <laughs> pump in crowd swell to make it sound like rah, and you're just like, really? And and I've been to a sound checks, and I'm not going to say who, and I've heard them test the crowd swell in the monitors and you or in the uh, speakers, or whatever. And you just go, 
No, for real, really? Come on. Come on. <laughs> okay, now you really got me going, because I'm an iconoclast. You must know that. I yes. Mean, People tell me, oh, Frank, what's wrong with you? You're always putting down your industry. <laughs> but if they're actually at the point where they're doing that, <laughs> well, I stand vindicated. Yep. Yeah, you, yeah you are. So, all right. So you've got live shows coming up. So I want to I wanna talk to you about those. Uh, first of all, and we'll, we'll go back to Frank Hannon for a second. I told Frank uh, about a month ago, I said, hey, Frank Marino's got some dates coming up. And he says, where, where? Tell me. I'm going to tell the Tesla guys that I'm booking that time off because I'm going to go to every one. I'm not, gonna, <laughs> not doing any Tesla shows. He goes, you, if he's in any whatever city, and I, th- I think it was Chicago, he goes, I'm going to go jam with him. That's what I'm going <laughs> to so, Yeah. So he was very excited about that. But okay, uh, the DVD, and we just spoke about it before, was from nine, ten years ago, and that's when the last tour was. Mm-hmm. Um. Talk to me about going back out on the road because, you know, when you're here in Montreal, and we mentioned it too, you, you get invited to these shows and you're not always one to go to the shows because you just like to be at home, if I can say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what motivated you or had you decide where you just go, okay, it's time. It's been a decade. I got to get out there. I got to go, you know, whatever, shake shake the bonbon or whatever. Well, <laughs> it, really, listen, it's it's it's. Uh, I had said this before. I said, if the DVD does well, we'll go out. If it doesn't do well, we won't. Because I'm going out because people have said yes. So I, I owe it to the people to say thank you. It's, 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 if it hadn't have done well and nobody cared and it was terrible and whatever, why would I go out and do that? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. I'd be trying to sell myself or something. It's not something I think about. So I, I don't know. Maybe I just look at this the wrong way, but I, I put a very high value on the fact that you're supported by people. I, I really do. Like in my own life, I'm often saying that. Like I'm very grateful for it because, you know, Let's face it, uh, Mitch, I'm just lucky that I, I was, you know, in the business and had my whole life in, in the rock business. And it's luck, you know, it could have been anybody. And, uh, and so I'm grateful. So the fact that it did well makes me say I'm going to go on the road and play some gigs. Okay. I, I, you know, I'd love to play everywhere. I can't because you can only play where the promoters think they'd like to have you. We don't plan these gigs. You know, you know that promoters call you and or call your agent and say uh, you know we want to have you here and then if they can make it work and everyone can get paid and you can pay your expenses then you go there but if they can't or if they won't or if there's certain areas where promoters say nah we're not interested even though you'd love to go you can't because it's always up to the promoter or the agent or the the buyer who's going to put the band somewhere but if they say they can I'd be, you know, I'd be an idiot to not go. And by the way, you just underlined my greatest pet peeve, I guess, and I don't want to say from fans, but when the tour is announced, they go, oh, you never come to Halifax. You hate yeah. Halifax. It's like, exactly. no, no, Frank it's doesn't hate Halifax. Tesla not doesn't hate. at all. It's, the not, pre- it's never the band. It's I'm never. I'm you that. Yeah, no, never the band. He, Look, I'll, oh, let me put it to you this way. Let me qualify that. In the case of the Rolling Stones, Big bands that are so rich, they basically make their own tours. They don't wait for the promoter to say, hey, we'd like to have you. They're doing it. They're, their whole system is doing it. Now, they're the ones that could go to Halifax and could go wherever they want. Right. They're paying for They're the promoter. But sometimes they're so big that they can't go into a city because there's just not the logistical support for, for like a Rolling Stones. It's sort of hard to just roll into, you know, saint Saint kind of thing, right? Well, no, that's not true either, because they could go to the Elma Combo and play there, which they did. Oh, yeah, and that's they look true. at it as like, oh, isn't this cool? We're playing the Elma Combo, you know? Look, at we've come down from the clouds to play the Elma Combo for people, right? No, 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 no. This, listen, if, you're in char- if you've got that much money and you've got that kind of a machine, because those kind of bands have machines, that's not just a band sitting around at home waiting for a call from an agent. You can go wherever you like. And you and and they and they will, but in the case of most bands, okay, not those huge giants, 
most bands, they do have to wait for some promoter to say, we'll have you here in Ottawa or we'll put you in Toronto or New York or whatever, right? I happen to believe that you're, that a band is better off playing near cities than in cities. I happen to, because, you know, a lot of the time they play in cities because they think that people from the outskirts will all come into the city. But but are we supposed to think that the people outside the city are less people than the people inside the city? I mean, that's like they're still people, right? It's the, this is it's this thing with the VIP tickets that people well, ask me I'm, about. I'm going to get to the VIPs in a second. Yeah. Let me just finish on the tour thing real quick. Well, the VIP is part of the tour thing, but the dates we have are April to May. They are exclusively American. Is just is this leg one? Is this it? Do we see Canadian dates? Do we see Japan dates? Do we see you know London, you you know UK dates? What sort of the the game plan, or is there is there a game plan? Is it no? The game plan is as if offers come in to go somewhere, the guy who's acting as the agent right now, the agency will call me and say, like just today, another he added another two, you know. He'll say, I got another two guys that want to add on to the tour. I says, go ahead. So this could, this could continue and it could not continue. It could continue incessantly and it could not continue. It's going to depend on the interest that's there. Okay. And, and so sometimes, Japan look, calls. We, had, we had four, we had, we had three offers from the West coast of America, but there was only three. So to get all the way there for the three offers, you need a whole bunch on the way and a whole bunch on the way back, or you can't pay for it. So we have to tell these West Coast guys, even though they really want to do it, yeah, we'd love to do it. Maybe we'll get there in the fall, you know, when, when things pick up. But there's no real plan. I don't plan this kind of stuff. It's like you go where people will want you. It's like going to a party where you're wanted. <laughs> you know, you don't want to go where you're not wanted. <laughs> You know, so you have to you have to wait till somebody says, you know, come to such and such a place, and and the answer is always going to be yes if it's possible. Never going to be no. You know, right. I've played gigs in my life. I did one gig, particularly gig in Windsor, Ontario. Promoter booked us there about ten years ago, maybe no, even more than ten years ago, like fifteen years ago. He books us in Windsor two nights at a very big six hundred seat place. Now, I don't know what happened. He didn't promote it or whatever. Nobody bought tickets. We get, to the, get, we get there on the day of the gig. Listen to this. He had 11 tickets sold on the day of the gig. Now, most bands would say, cancel. I said, why cancel? We're here. Let's play the gig for the 11 people. Bring them up on stage. This is the greatest experience they could possibly have. The only 11 guys. It's the band they wanted to see. And we did, and we played three and a half hours and did our whole thing with them. Wow, that's a see now that's a fan experience. All right, so let, let's get into a fan experiences. Every band, almost every band, sells the very important person package, the VIP experience with the picture and the autograph and the right. sound check and the. And I'm getting a lot of flack because I said you know, in an interview a little while ago that I don't believe in that kind of thing. Um, you know, I, I likened it to, well, look, if you're, if you're going to create a VIP package, by definition, you're creating an LIP package, a less important person package. What you're basically doing is you're creating two classes of supporter, the ones that can afford to be your supporter and the ones that can't. I won't do that. Now, from the beginning of my career, I have always met whoever wanted to meet me. If, I'm, if I have the time, I'm not going to say I'm going to absolutely do it, but if I'm not leaving and I'm hanging out or whatever and there's time, I'll meet whoever's there and I'll sign whatever they have. And, and I've always done that. So could you imagine having done that since 1971, that I'm going to start charging people to do what I've always done for nothing? That makes no sense. Now, that's just me. I'm not saying that it's bad if the other guys do it. They can do it. You know, they have, they have to make their money or whatever. They don't have enough money for the tour. They want to play somewhere. They have to add that on. But to me, it just seems like you're creating two classes of supporter, the ones that can afford it and the ones that can't. 
how then would you be able, let's say you do that. Let's say you are doing that. You've got the VIP ticket one night. I've heard a story about a guy in a certain band who, who was, who was uh, come on to by a father who had a 14-year-old son. But he hadn't bought the tickets. He couldn't afford it. And he was standing right next to the guy, and he asked the guy if he would sign something for his son, and he said, sorry, you needed to buy the VIP ticket. Better luck next year. What the heck is that? I, I, really, I don't know. That's... I, mean, I mean, who the hell do we think we are? Yeah. We're not saving the world here. We're supported by these fans. If not for them, there wouldn't be a show. As much as I say it's the promoter and it's the agent and it's everybody else, which it's true, it is, that promoter and agent, they're basing that idea of bringing you into a town based on what they think they can sell to people. It comes from people. Now, I can see doing a VIP promoter and a less IP promoter and picking one promoter over another, but I can't see telling that to a fan. Because at the end of the day, man, that's where it's all coming from, whether it's records or tickets or anything. So why would you do that? Yeah, I agree. And and I'll tell you, <clears throat> there's a couple. Of, I have a couple of points on, on VIPs myself. There, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna sell them and you're going to make them available, you need to do it first class. You know, there was a artist that my daughter wanted to see. Now, I didn't pay for the VIP. She, I, I got invited and all that. But the people that were at that VIP were paying $750 to get a picture. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have a professional photographer. They, they, they had basically a, a roadie who would grab your cell phone. And this, yeah. was, this, was, <clears throat> this was like 10 years ago when cell phones were shitty. I understand. And he would grab it and just take a real quick picture. And the picture my daughter got was all smudged and out of focus. Because, you know, with a cell phone, if you go too yeah. fast. I and understand. I'm, and I'm just thinking, well, I was like, well, you know, Jada, you know, well, we didn't pay for this. So just smile. Well, let, let, me, let me throw but, this question out to the groups that have the VIP tickets. Yeah. Why not charge 10 bucks? What, is well, that too low? Well. <laughs> what does that mean? If you did charge 10 bucks, you'd have 600 people at the gig and 600 people at the VIP. But you won't do that. Why? So it, it, this whole idea that we're going to create this, this double class, it's exactly what goes on with gear. You know that, with gear. Got, where, I love the music. I love music. I love the fact that people invent music. And, and most pe- good music is invented by people between the ages of 16 and 22. All right, younger people. But they're not getting the great gear and the great guitars and the great pedals and the great amps because those things are five, six thousand dollars. So the best equipment is basically being sold to blues lawyers. You know what a blues lawyer is? Yeah, that's funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Disposable funny. income and on the weekend they play in their blues band. Right? Yeah. And they've got the Bogners and they've got the this pedal and that guitar and this, and all the best, and those are good stuff. You know, the Bogners, that's, that's all good stuff. That's not bad stuff. But it's, it's so highly priced that the, the people who would make the best use of it are not being given the chance to do it because they don't have $4,000. It's exactly the same thing. We're creating classes of people based on their ability to pay. And that, to me... I'm sorry, you know, there's a guy's, I got some phone calls because I said, you know, why are you having them line up at a, at a, at a rope line and come sit on your lap like you're Santa Claus? These are adults. Just talk to them. I got flack for this from some guys who don't like the fact that I'm saying it. Why? Because maybe, maybe it'll sink in and they'll stop doing it. But the fact is you can't treat people like that. You want respect, you give respect. That's how you get it. Yeah, You'll that's demand a, it. That's a, that, and I agree with that. And, and I'll, yeah. I'll say this, the other thing on that, and then I'll, we'll move on just real quick. But, but yeah. the, the VIP, I, I can see there are some bands that are playing the clubs. And, uh, you know, listen, I was talking to one of the bands, and I was like, well, you're doing 100 bucks for a VIP, to play, and, you're, and you're playing literally to 100 people tonight. And they were like, yeah, but we make about $3,000 a week by it, and that's what... Uh, gets us the tour bus, and if it wasn't for the VIP, we'd have to be out here in a van, and 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 it would it, it would just be very uncomfortable. And 
So I can sort of see that, but when you get to those I, higher... I see why. Yeah. I don't, I'm not saying I don't see why they do it. I, I agree with them. They're right. They have to do that to be able to do it. I get that. I'm not stupid. The point is, I, I think people should own it. You know, they should say, listen, it's not right, but we have to do it. Because there's a difference between doing something and doing something that's right. It's not... It, Maybe right is the wrong word. It's certainly not fair. I mean, fair means that you're excluding people that can't buy that ticket. But if it was 10 bucks, they could, or 15 Or maybe if you're going to charge them, like you said, you had one at $750? Yeah. $750? Really? And, re- okay, and that's, that's char- reasonable for an arena. Some of the arena <laughs> you're ones... You're charge someone $750. But, but some well, of the arena more than ones... take a picture. Yeah. Well, some of the arena ones are are, are twenty two. Go to to dinner or something. No, you know, (laughs) Uh, bring them to your house. I don't know. Give them a guitar lesson. I mean, do something. Well, yeah. But to stand and take a picture, and you know, I've been on those. I've I've been there where they have the table and people are sitting at the table to hack, you know, to hack the hawk their merchandise. And they come along and they say, can I take a picture? And then the guy walks around the table and the artist stands up, sort of half stands up. And the other guy bends half down and they smile at the camera. And that happens four, five, six, ten times in a row. And I'm thinking, hey, if you put all those pictures together, it'll be like that funhouse thing where you have wooden guys with a hole in the wood where you put your face through. Hey, look at me with so-and-so. Look at me with so-and-so. It's all the same picture. You're right. It's not, it's not real. It's like you said, it's like pumping crowd through the, through the speakers. It's not real. Okay, people want to spend it. They want to spend it. That's their business. I'm not going to tell them not to. I'm not a, uh, you know, I believe people should be free, totally free to do what they want. But I'm allowed to think that I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's uh, all I'm saying. <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, that, that crowd swell, uh, boy, that, that, that time that I was at that, I was at Soundcheck at 2 in the afternoon and they were going through the crowd swell and... At the show, I was like, no, they're not actually going to be using it. And we listened, you know, me and my buddy that were there, who's a radio mm-hmm. guy. Mm-hmm. And we're like, they're fucking using it. And so I yeah. mentioned it to a couple of other, other artists who were in, in arena bands. And they went, yeah, 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 we've been doing that for 10 years. I'm like, what? Now, well, you just got me because <laughs> I thought I knew everything about the business. Like, and what? I never knew they were doing that. Uh, That's for sure. L- let me ask you about new music because it's it's been quite a while since you've put out a new album or a new solo album. Uh, w- is it important for what you do to to be creative and come up with something new to give the fans in twenty 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 one, or is this at a point where, you know what, if I made something new, you know, whatever. Where are you on new music and how important is it to you and how is important is it to stay creative and, and come up with new ideas and, and sort of well, I'm always re- I'm always recording new ideas here. I've got over eighty tunes that no one's ever heard, and uh, the reason no one's ever heard them is because a lot of them don't fit maybe necessarily the mahogany rush thing. I'm I'm a different kind. I'm a musician who likes a lot of different styles, so uh, I write pop tunes. Pure pop, two and a half minute, three three minute pop tunes. I put them in, you know, put them in a vault. Um, I write jazz, blues, all kinds of different styles, even film stuff. I'm always recording something or trying to come up with something new and interesting, but not necessarily that it's going to be the next Frank Marino or Mahogany Rush record, and maybe it will. Who knows? But it, there's no plan. You know, it's like I'm a musician. That's what I do. I make music. Oh, okay, <laughs> let, let me take you up on that for a second, because that, that's mm-hmm. an interesting thing that you said, that not everything is Mahogany Rush. So does it have to fit a mold? Does it have to have sort of like an ACDC kind of stamp where it's like, well, this is what, this is what ACDC does. So, I mean, it, you've been in the business so long. You've been around. Can you not just be like a Madonna or U2 and just put out an album of whatever and just say, hey, this is what Frank Marino well, is lo- in 2020. Love, yeah, Frank Marino can. Frank Marino can. Mahogany Rush. That in words, Mahogany Rush, it's very much about a certain type of music, about a certain kind of experience that I had when I was young. And Mahogany Rush is not the name of a band of guys. Mahogany Rush is the name of an experience that I had. And that, you know, I've been trying to make that psychedelic experience uh, known to people since I was 
14 years old. But Frank Marino, certainly. I've written these, you know, if you heard these pop tunes, if I had a buck for every time someone heard my pop tunes, I'd say, what the hell are you doing? You have millions of dollars in pop tunes here. They're really good. They're hits. Uh, why don't you put them out? Well, maybe one day I will. <laughs> but if, you, but if, these, if I do a tune like Penny Lane and I try to play it with Mahogany Rush, it doesn't fit. It's got to fit. And I do have stuff like that like Beatlesque type of material that I happen to like writing. I like writing pop tunes. But pop isn't the only stuff. There's some pretty avant-garde jazz. You know, I have a history as a, as a drummer who likes jazz. And so I like that too. You can't put all of that on a Mahogany Rush record no, any more than you could take a Sinatra record and put an ACDC tune on it or vice versa. So... Everything will have its place, but the tunes are still the tunes. And as a musician, you know, the, what the word means, a music guy, I just like music. Now, I happen to do it in a band called Mahogany Rush, and we do psychedelic music, and people like that, and some of it's blues-based. But not everything I write is that, that's for sure. And I think it's important for, I don't like to call myself an artist, I think it's an overused word, but I'm a musician, like all our friends are. I think you're a musician too, Mitch. Right? Aren't you? Right. Well, no, but that, but it's just it's just uh, I, I've always found this interesting. It, it, there's a dichotomy where you you have like a, and like I said before, like an artist like Madonna and and you too that always reinvent themselves and they do albums that sound completely different than the one before, and then you've got sort of your Aerosmiths and your Kisses and your ACDCs, which they do what ACD, you know, ACDC makes Yeah, an they bottle it. Yeah, they, they bottle you know, it, and yeah. and it's interesting. And so I, I was, I'm, I'm, I was curious as as to why you're not just saying, "Hey, listen, I can be like you too." This year you're getting my pop record, and next year you'll get my jazz record, and the year after that you'll get my whatever blues based, uh, you know. Well, the, the interesting thing about that is that's kind of what I did, you know, toe in the water, kind of what I did on each album. So the big problem that Columbia Records had with me for all those years, and David Krebs and all these guys, was, who are you? So you've got this record out, you know, and it's got a heavy rock tune, and it's got a psychedelic tune, and then it's got a ballad, and then it's got a jazz tune, and then it's got a blues tune, and they didn't know how to sell it. They, they literally, and that was an actual conversation. I'm not just assuming they didn't know how to sell it. They were telling me that. What, how do we sell you? Because you keep giving us nine songs on an album, and there's at least six styles. Like, we don't know how to sell you. And I'd say, well, that's what you're getting. That's what I am. That's just what I am. So in a way, I was kind of doing that, but doing it in the scope of the Mahogany Rush sound. But you listen to something like Moonlight Lady, and all of a sudden you listen to Land of a Thousand Nights. It's like two different bands on the same record. Right. That's true. You know? So, so I've always been like that. But to actually go out now and say I'm going to do my pop tunes or do my, my blues tunes, I would have to do the whole record like that and make it fit. And that's why I said Frank Marino can do it, but Mahogany Rush can't necessarily do it. Because there's going to be this kind of expectation that Mahogany Rush does something slightly different. Which, by the way, I think it, that you mentioned Krebs and stuff. The, these are old school guys from the 70s and 80s. I, I think we've actually come a long way from then because back then, yeah. everything was cookie cutter. I mean, you had, you know, your 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 your, your monkeys and your your Herman's Hermits and your Beatles. And, yeah. the, and everything was like, okay, well, this is this sound. And since then, it's got to be so refreshing as an artist to go out in 2019 and 2020 and say, hey, I'm going to make an album. And I don't have to fit any mold. I, it'll just—we've really come a long way from those conversations. I don't—I don't know if you'd have those conversations today anymore, quite frankly. Well, yeah, you probably—they probably don't have that anymore. It's—it is kind of different, um, and I'm—and I'm kind of glad that it is, you know. Uh, but I'm—I'm I'm in my fiftieth year now, so the way I'm sort of looking at it is okay. I got all the way here sort of being who I was. A lot of people did think, you know, when I left the, when I left the, the majors and on my own choice, 
a lot of people thought, well, you know, he's just kidding. Well, obviously I wasn't kidding. I really had had enough with that kind of stuff that, that we're talking about. And I really did think, you know, I don't want to be part of that. I just want to be a musician. And hey, I've managed to get 50 years. I mean, that's pretty good. That's pretty lucky. You're going to get me to... started on branding, by the way, because your tour in 2020 has not been branded the 50th anniversary tour, which it is, if you go back to 1970, right? So, yeah, yeah. So it is. Is, that, is that another thing where you're... Well, not, I'm not trying to. Listen, okay. the agent that's working with me certainly is saying you should do that. So my answer is, yeah, you want to do that, do that. In, in other words... If that's what people think, look, the, be the greatest example of that is this. Wherever I go to play, I get two kinds of promoter. I, I get to the town and I see Frank Marino on the marquee. I get to another town, I see Mahogany Rush on the marquee. And I get to another town, I see Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush on the marquee. That's because the promoter there figures that he'll do better if he uses my name or the band name or both names. I don't object to any of that. If that's what he wants to do, that's what he wants to do. Because it's all kind of the same anyway, as far as I'm concerned. There's no difference. And I think people who know the band know that. Now, certainly people who don't know the band might not know that. And so from a marketing point of view, maybe I'm being a bit stupid and maybe I should be more careful about how I'm branding things. But I think when you begin to look at music as a brand... You begin to change the, moti the, the motivation as to why you do it. I mean, I never, ever yeah. did a record with that in mind, with, hey, if we do this, that'll be good for this, you know, with that kind of um, mo motivation based on success. You know, it's uh, interesting because I, I always say brand trumps band. You know, when, when people go, yeah. well, Quiet Riot changed their members and Kiss changed their members. I go, it doesn't matter. You, you put yeah. Kiss on the marquee, you're going to go see it because it says Kiss. That's, yeah. and, and brand, brand trumps band. I mean, not musically or whatever, but in terms of putting asses in a seat, brand trumps, trumps band. Yeah, so, so that's thinking of it from that, perspective, right? But what does the word band really mean? It means something making music. For instance, it's not a band if they're selling jewelry. Okay, so what are we doing? We're making music, it's based on sound, and a lot of the time that gets the shortest shrift in the conversation. I've been involved in conversations where I've asked about sound and guys in other bands that says, oh, stop always talking about the sound, as if it doesn't mean as much. So I guess it's just a question of the outlook. You know, there's a reason why I'm considered an iconoclast, and that's because I do kick back against the norms, and the norms in our industry are, what should we do to sell? Absolutely. And I don't, I don't think that way. I don't think that way. And and those guys saying that, what about the sound? Because they're they're all programmed in this new wave, new age of, well, if the vocalist is off, we'll hit the auto tune. If this is off, we'll hit the delay. And if this is off, we'll hit the extra this. And if and we'll we'll hit the tape here. And we'll 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 put the crowd swell there. So there's a fix for almost any problem. And so they don't really care about organic sound anymore. We're in the holidays right now, right? There's holidays going on everywhere. Uh -huh. People are going to go visit their families. They're going to get together. Some of them have pianos in their houses, and some of them get out the acoustic guitar, right? And they do sing-alongs. Do you honestly think any one of them is sitting around saying, hey, play some originals? No. <laughs> you know, you sit around the piano and sing Jingle Bells and all the great music that makes people happy to get together. And no one's sitting around taking themselves so seriously at the holiday party saying, hey, let me play you my originals and let me make them perfect. They're singing out of tune and they're, they're clapping along and they're having fun and that's what music is doing. It's bringing people together to have fun and to smile, to, to forget about the ills of the world for a few hours, you know, if we could possibly do that. That's what I look at it as. 
it's well, that's just, what it's supposed I've to be. All, I've always looked at it that way. It's like we sort of lost the nature of music. I mean, we we we've, we've sort of lost grasp. I mean, I've been listening to what my daughter listens to, and it's it's all this uh, whatever dance music, urban music, whatever it is, and it's just one auto tuned person after another. And I'm like, well, where's the soul? Where where's the it's it's computer. And I go, computer's not an instrument. And my daughter said she's 16. She goes, yeah, computer is an instrument. And I went. Okay, I've, I'm I'm officially old because not to me. <laughs> well, it's yeah, and and why is that that way? Because the very people who were were let's say given the responsibility for music, which is the musicians of our era and the eras beyond us, began to say it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Why did they say it didn't matter? Because as long as we can make our weekly pay, it didn't matter. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with making your weekly pay, and I believe that a person should be paid for their work. There's no free stuff as far as I'm concerned. I'm not a socialist. But by any stretch of the imagination, I happen to think it's poison. But at the same time, whatever you do do, whether you play music for a guy or you build him a chair or a guitar or maybe you go over and help him do his gardening, you should be doing the best possible job at whatever you do. You should be giving a person quality with, with, you know, for something. People said, how come your DVD is six hours? Well, the gig was 12 hours. I'm lucky to get it down to six hours. You oh. give them something that's quality, good looking, good sounding, good everything, as much as you good can, value. as much as you can control it. You can't control it when you're on some festival. Because you're, you know, you're at the, you're at the mercy of who's got the sound and who's got the lights, and you don't just don't have the money to control everything. But when you put out a record, you can control it. You can give them good quality, the best stuff. I mean, if you had a restaurant, what are you going to feed them junk? You well, know, you give them good do. quality. Of course. Yeah, a lot of people do. A lot but, of people do. I, I don't know. I just think that people, people who spend their, you have to understand that people who spend their money. Worked for it. They worked. Those six hundred dollar tickets represents their salary. They're not just you know having to throw six hundred dollars and burn it, or seven hundred and fifty dollars to meet someone and take a picture. They worked. Some of them worked two weeks, three weeks. Some of them saved up. Some of them did without something in order to get that. It's a big thing for them. So why would we treat them like cattle? Oh, listen, I, I, I fully agree. Listen, my, my daughter wants to go see a show in, um, I'm trying to think, March 1st or something. And she went and got herself a job so she could save up to go pay for it because she wants to pay this $1,900 or whatever. And this is like, yeah, because I ain't paying $1,900 for you. Not, not, <laughs> not, not for a show. That ain't going to happen. I have three daughters. <laughs> I know. So, so you know how it is. But at least, listen, at least I... I it's a waste of money, I think, but uh, but I appreciate the initiative to go out and get a job to want to pay for it. That you can't fault that. It's like, well, okay, you know, it's great. It yeah. is great. So that what I'm all I'm saying is, and your daughter, you know, she wants to do that. That's really great. And she, and even if we think that she's wasting it, okay, we think she's wasting it, but she worked for it. But then when she goes to get whatever it is she's getting, could be I don't know. At least the people giving it to her should respect that. Yeah. That right. it meant something to that person. And so we're back to the VIP, LIP thing. Very important person creates a less important person if you begin classing them that way. I, and if you do that, how do you look at the less important person, and I put that in quotes, and say hi to the guy? Hi, Mr. Less Important Person. You didn't pay me the money. You're getting half of me. They're getting all of me. That's not cool. So I just say, you know what? I'll just meet whoever I meet. And I'll sign whoever I sign. And I'll take a picture with anyone that wants it. And they, sometimes they come to me with multiple stuff to sign. I know they're selling it on eBay. I don't say no. Oh, go ahead. If you think you can make yourself a few bucks, knock yourself out. It's not that easy. 
That's funny. There, there was one artist I was on a on a bus with, and this guy showed up with a couple of shopping bags of vinyl. There was there must have been like thirty. Yeah, and you could tell, right? Yeah, he, of course. He, and and uh, the artist at some point started writing, "Dear eBay buyer, congratulations." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell the I tell the people that do that. I do tell them. I go, you're selling them, aren't you? He goes, no, no, no. It's for my friends. And I go, come on, dude. I'm going to sign him anyway. There's no need to lie. I'm going to sign him, and I'm laughing. <laughs> I know what you're doing. It's cool. You're an enterprising young guy. Yeah. You think you're going to go out and sell him? But guess what? I signed so many things. My signature's worth nothing. Right. Well, that's it. Anyway, that's what I do. I sign everything I can because it's worth nothing. Well, he values it. Right. Supply and demand. On, on I told, that, I, I told an actor friend of mine who was upset about photographers, you know, chasing them around. I said, you don't want them to chase you around? Just go out every day and give pictures of yourself to everybody. They won't chase you. They're not chasing you because you're great. They're chasing you because they can get money for your photo. You know, that's actually a very good point. They they mm-hmm. chase for the, the scarcity or the rarity. If you that's come right. out every day and release to the internet 10 pictures of, here's my whatever. Yeah, yeah. I just ate toast, here it is, and here's me in my bathrobe and whatever, then it'll be worth nothing. They'll leave you alone, and you can walk down the street. There was a, a guy once that said, poor Elvis, poor Elvis, he can't go anywhere. And another guy said, yeah, well, when you walk around in a cape. <laughs> You know, sort of a point. On that, sir, I am. I am. I do have to go actually go get my daughter. Mm-hmm. So uh, thank you for 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 this. As always, toujours un plaisir, as we say here mm-hmm. in Montreal. And it's funny because you're actually in Montreal, so you actually understand what I'm saying. But I uh, do. But uh, merci beaucoup, and and hopefully uh, we will get a a Canadian run of shows, and I'm sure they will come. I'm sure there's a promoter in Montreal that has already probably contacted you because you are a local, what, what's the word? I, I don't, if we I don't put on a, no, if we do a Montreal show, there's, there's only one guy that I'll use to do it. It's the guy that did my Corona show. And, uh, when we played here last, I thought he did a really great job and now he's promoting other shows. And uh, I think if we're going to do that, I may talk to him and say, let's do this again. Obviously, it won't be up to Corona again, because I think Ivanko has that now. I was one of the first acts to use that place, if not the first. So um, Great venue, you know, by the way. Great, yeah, we'll find venue. a new one and we'll do it again. But And hopefully we will do it again, like at the end of the tour or whatever. We'll see. It's always in flux. There's, everything's in flux right now. You know, like it's, I'm okay with that. Let's just jam with the people the way we jam with the musicians and let things happen the way they happen. I'd love people to come out and see us when we play. I'd love them to go get the DVD because the more they get the DVD, the easier it makes it to, uh, to go out and tour. But, um, you know, God will, be the, God will be the judge of what happens. It's, love, like it's, all, it's all up to him. So. Let me help out with that here. Of course, there's a mahoganyrush.net where you can purchase the uh, the DVD. And uh, there you go. So folks should definitely check out Frank Marino live at the Agora Theater and uh, mahoganyrush.net. And uh, voila, as they say. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. One last question for yes. you yes, off sir. the record. Oh, let me turn off the tape. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.